Um, we've seen uh, mostly object-oriented programming in Android so far, but recently there's been um, a pickup of some more functional programming paradigm things in Android programming uh, with the use of Kotlin, um, RxJava, MVI architecture, stuff like that. But what does it really mean to write functional code? And this is what we're gonna be talking about in this talk today. Now, I'm not going to be trying to explain monads or category theory. Um, that can be another talk for someone to explain. Um, but I'm gonna be talking about some of the other functional programming principles and how we can use them in our code. This talk came from my interest in functional programming. I don't have a specific background in it, so this came from me learning, so now I can teach you the things that I've learned. So just a quick show of hands so I can see a little bit as much as I can see with these bright lights. Um, who here is um, familiar and has worked with Kotlin? Okay, and then RxJava. Okay, I'll be using um, these things quite a bit in my examples, um, I'll explain them. Um, just to make sure that they're understood, even if you're not too familiar with them, so that we can all be on the same page. Um, a quick note before we get started, I do have these slides pinned to my Twitter profile, at TTGonda, if you want to follow along or look at them afterwards, um, just so you know. A um, little bit about me before we get started. I'm an Android engineer at a company called Buffer. Um, we're we make apps that make it easy to schedule posts for social media, track performance, and manage accounts. We're a fully remote company, um, so feel free to ask me anything about them or working remotely. I'm also an author for Ray Winderlich. Um, they are a tutorial site. Um, I'm on their Android and Kotlin team, so I help them write tutorials for that, um, which has been so much fun to be a part of. I am based out of Chicago, and I am also a dancer. Lately, I've been doing mostly tap dance. So why functional programming? We're seeing an increase of the use of functional programming, like I said, with things like Kotlin, RxJava, Arrow. And this is because some of these features can be used to write cleaner, more expressive code. It can simplify concurrency and it can be easier to test. And we'll take a look at why some of those things are. So really, what is it? It's not a tool or a library, it's a paradigm. It's a way of thinking about and writing code, so it's a really a bunch of concepts. It came from Lambda Calculus and it shows in the way things are evaluated. Um, we'll see this mostly in pure functions with no side effects. Um, don't worry, we're not gonna be talking about the calculus stuff, but it kind of makes sense in some of the things that we'll be looking at how things can be evaluated, kind of like mathematical expressions. This in turn can help make things easier to write tests. I mean, math has proofs, why shouldn't we have tests? So what are some of the properties that we have here? Functional programming aims to be declarative. You wanna focus more on what the computer should be doing, rather than how. We see this tendency even outside of functional programming with abstractions. You also wanna be explicit. You want it to be clear what is happening. Minimizing the surprises that you get because maybe the code behaved differently because a Boolean field in this class was changed and you didn't expect it to be. Um, these kinds of things are things that we're avoiding. Using constructs and data flow that can get us into these unexpected states um, also falls into this category of things that we're avoiding here. The fewer side effects and more explicit code, the better. Functional programming also um, lends itself well to concurrency. Because of the characteristics of functional programming, it lends itself well to this. We'll see how some of the co these concepts solve some of the things that make concurrency difficult. 
higher order function, you'll also see, or functional programming, you'll also see higher order functions. Um, this makes functions first class citizens, so you can pass a function around just like an instance of an, of an object or class. Immutability is also important in functional programming. Once something is set, you can't change it. If you want something different, like something changed on an object that you have, you have to create an entire new one. This helps keep surprises to a minimum, especially when working with different threads. Nothing is going to change out from under you. So these are the things that we're gonna go over in this talk. We're gonna be talking about what it means to have pure functions with no side effects, and how this can affect ordering. We'll also be talking about immutability, how all this works to help with concurrency, and then we'll also go over um, what higher order functions are. So starting at the top with pure functions. Pure functions always give the same output for a given input, even if that input is nothing. Like an empty input is still considered an input. Everything that is required for the operation is passed in. This can make things easier to test. Have you ever had something that the setup just makes it too hard to test, too hard to isolate, there's so many outside things that you have to set up in order to test this one function? This helps with that because it's only concerned about the inputs, and you test the outputs. If you think about this from a math perspective, addition only cares about the two numbers that you passed in, and it gives the same result every time. Every time you pass in a two and a three, you're gonna get a five. So let's look at a fun example. Let's take a blend function for a blender. Every time that you add vanilla ice cream and chocolate syrup and milk, you want a chocolate milkshake, not a chocolate banana. And when you use strawberry syrup, you want a strawberry milkshake. So here's our function, let's see if it's pure. This is a blender function to make a milkshake. We pass in some ingredients and get a milkshake back. The milk and the ice cream, however, is in a variable outside of the function. So what if someone else goes and swaps out the vanilla ice cream for chocolate or raspberry? So it looks like this function is not pure. It's not solely dependent on its inputs to determine the outputs. So let's turn it into a pure function. Now everything is passed into the function and there's no reliance on outside variables. We can be more confident that this function will give us the result that we expect. There's no way some other part of the code is going to change the ice cream on us now and we won't run into those unexpected bugs because of it. Because of this change, it can also make it easier to test as well. If we had written a test for it before, we would have had to set up the whole environment, make sure those fields were set to the right kind of milk and ice cream and everything else. Now we just have to worry about the inputs and test the output, no context needed. Pure functions also have no side effects. Similar to not depending on outside variables, it also doesn't change anything outside. This could include changing a field or a global variable, writing to a file or the database. Um, a side effect could also be throwing an error. Because pure, or because with no side effects, because it doesn't change anything outside, it also lessens the dependence. Having side effects in your code can make it more difficult to read. There's information outside of the function that needs to be understood in order to understand what the function is doing itself. Thinking about this from the math perspective again, addition doesn't change anything outside of the function. That would be kind of weird. So let's like look at our milkshake function again. What if in the function it changed the number of glasses on a shelf? Would that be avoiding side effects? 
So here's the blender again, but this time it's taking a glass from a cl collection of glasses. So that's clearly a side effect. What if another part of the program was expecting that glass to be there to make a root beer float? And now we have an unexpected error because there, that glass isn't there and how are we gonna make our milkshake? Instead, let's pass the glass in. This way, we know the function is safe and doesn't cause anything unexpected. It's a pure function with no side effects. Now think of the tests that might have been written for our function. With the side effect, we would have needed to write an additional text to check for the number of glasses and the behavior, depending on how many glasses are in the list, or forget to write those tests, then we ship it, and all of a sudden we have crashes because there's no glass there when we expect it to be. Now we're safe from that, and we have one less test to write, and one less worry. I realize that sometimes side effects can be unavoidable. Of course, there's gonna be a time when we need to save something to the database and retrieve it later, and various different things, especially when interacting with the Android system. But pushing these um, impure functions to the edges of your code and having as many of your own functions pure will help minimize surprises and bring clarity to your code. If you can isolate them, other parts of your code don't have to depend on them. This is an example from the buffer code base. Um, and it's an example of a pure function. Um, realize this is technically a lambda, but that's a lambda's a function. Um, so in this example, um, it uses what we've talked about so far and some of the things that we're gonna move on to talk about next. This comes from a view model using a reactive MVI architecture. It maps results from actions to UI states. So within it, we're seeing what type of results it is to help determine the state. And within it, we're paying attention to the status in addition to help determine what the UI model state should be. So if we have a load folders task that it's a success, we're gonna have a UI model that the folders are loaded so that the view can show it. Notice that in there we're also not worried about catching any errors, rather responding to it just as any other type of data. In functional programming, generally errors are treated just as another type of data. And this follows that. We're not throwing the errors, um, considering an error would be uh, causing a side effect. So here we have a pure function, or lambda, that always gives the same outputs given some inputs. It has no side effects. We're easily able to test for each of these conditions. We're also using some other functional language properties that we're gonna go into deeper in a minute. Um, because it's independent of context, we could call this in any order alongside other peer functions as well as concurrently. In fact, this is part of an Rx Java stream is where we're using this. Um, these folder UI models are also immutable, which provides additional safety and adheres to the idea of immutability in functional programming. And then, like I said, we're also handling errors in a functional programming way, treating them as another type of data. So moving along, ordering. When we have pure functions that only depend on input and don't change the state of the world, Order stops mattering. Pure functions can be executed in any order, assuming that the output of one isn't the input of another. You don't have to worry about the order of things, so it can make it easier to read, because it doesn't have that dependency. This also means that they can be executed at the same time without worries, so you can see how that can help with concurrency. Um, like I said, you can't always have pure functions that don't depend on order in Android. The button has to be created, and then we can change the color and the text and all that. And then we can set a click listener. Um, but it's great when we can use 
pure functions for our logic. If you add one and two, it doesn't change the result of five minus three, no matter what order they're in. We can do them in any order or even at the same time. So picture this example. Um, making toast, mixing eggs, and frying bacon. Um, you sh should think that these could be very independent of each other and be done in any order or even at the same time. So let's take a closer look at one of these functions, specifically the make toast functions. Notice that it's relying to something on something outside of the input. It's grabbing a cook to make the item of food from a collection of other cooks. It turns out all three of these functions are doing this. But what if a cook is homesick and there's not enough hands? Or what if the wrong cook gets pulled in to make the wrong thing? Um, we can't have the toast burner making the toast. We think they will always be the same every time, but other things also have access to this pool, but you know, we're pretty sure. And those are always where the best bugs come up. So let's change this function to make it pure. Now our cook is passed in as a parameter. Everything that it's depended on is passed in. This means they can now be called in any order. If we have three cooks, we can get it done at the same time. Sure, why not? Since we know none of the functions rely on the others. And then to bring it back to testing for just a second, as easy it was to test the pure functions, uh, it's easy to test that these are working well together because we don't really have to worry about the order. We don't have that extravagant setup, just the inputs and the outputs. Next, immutability. So with immut immutability, there's no changing things. If you want something different, say a different attribute on um, a class, you have to create an entirely new object. With this, you know things won't change out from under you. You do have to watch out for immutable child objects. If you have something that's immutable, but it has, say, an immutable uh, list on it, no, you can't assign a new list to it, but you can change the contents of that list. And we'll look into how to combat that a little bit in a minute. Numbers don't change in math, so we're not gonna be changing things here. A four won't magically turn into a five. It can be the result of four plus one, but a four just sitting there won't change its value. So revisiting our diner, how strange would it be if somewhere between the griddle and a table, a veggie burger turned into a beef burger? That wouldn't be right, and rather unexpected. So let's see how we can avoid that. So here's our burger. We have our type of burger as a string, as a property on it. In case you're not familiar with Kotlin, we're using var for the property, which makes it mutable. Here's the Java equivalent to show you what it means to have a mutable property. There's a field that's set in the constructor, along with a getter and a setter. It's that setter that makes the difference here. After we make that burger, we can change what type it is. So imagine the unexpected behavior we can get from that, like getting the wrong kind of burger delivered to your table. So let's make this immutable. In Kotlin, all we have to do is change that var to a val that makes this a final property or an immutable property. And then strings are immutable, so we don't have to worry about the string object itself changing. And then here's the Java equivalent, so we can understand that a bit better. It made the field final, as well as removed the setter. The class is also final. Um, classes are final by default in Kotlin, which is why we didn't make any changes there. Now, if we were to try to modify the type, we wouldn't be able to. We'd have a compiler error. If we want a beef burger, we'll have to create an entirely new one. 
With smart casting in Kotlin, it pays attention to if something is mutable and could have changed. Let's look at if we want to make the type mutable again, and this time we're also making it nullable. Nullability is built into the type system in Kotlin. Um, we're showing that the type could be null here by appending a question mark after string. Um, so the type is storing whether something can be nullable or not. If we check for null, then call something on it, the compiler still complains because it could have been changed to null by then on another thread. Always the most fun thing to try to find. Um, it's mutable, so yeah, technically this could happen. Then when we change it to be immutable, and here again it's still nullable, Kotlin will smart cast it to a non-null type since it's impossible for that value to be changed. It's immutable. This is great. We can see the wonders this can do for preventing unexpected behavior, especially when it comes to concurrency. There's still another thing we do have to watch out for. Um, we made it so we can't reassign a property. But if that property itself is mutable, that can change. So imagine we have an additional property for our burgers, which is toppings. This is a list. No, we can't assign a new list to it. But if the list is mutable, like default lists in Java, we can change the items in the list. Again, this can lead to unexpected behavior. This would be the same as maybe a chain of matrix in a math equation mid solve. In this example, we can't change the items in the list. We can change the items in the list even though we can't reassign the list. So it looks like this customer is getting onions whether they really wanted them or not. We want our burgers to be predictable. So how do we do this? In Kotlin, it's pretty easy. Kotlin has both mutable and immutable list types, with the default being immutable. This means after creation, they can't change. You can't change the contents. Easy enough. If we had mutable objects in the list, we'd have also have to um, go down the nesting and make sure those things were immutable as well. But because we're handling the strings here, this is as far down as we have to go. To make this safe with Java, we have to make one option is making a copy of the list whenever it's requested. That way, if that list is changed, it's not um, changing the original copy of that list. Same thing here. If we had mutable objects, we'd have to go, go down the stack or go down the nesting to make those things immutable. Now this customer isn't getting any onions, but maybe some other customer who wanted them is. There are a couple other options you could have done here to make it immutable. Um, you could wrap the collection and take away all the mutator methods or use a library that does this, or just use Kotlin. I'm always for that option. Here's an example of us using immutability in our code base. Um, when we want to change the profiles on an update here, um, we don't want to create any unexpected states with something that was currently using and depending on those updates, or those profiles. So we do that by creating a copy of the update and changing only the profiles. And Kotlin provides a method on data classes to make this really easy for us. So now concurrency. We all want to work on this, but it can be hard. Um, but using pure functions with no side effects and immutability can help with this. We can do things on different threads without worrying about unexpected behavior. Locks aren't required, so we don't have to worry about deadlock. When two equations are evaluated, the evaluation of one doesn't change the, the results of the other. Keeping up with our burger example, making one burger shouldn't change the toppings on a different burger. When one person orders a veggie burger with tomato and another a veggie burger with lettuce, they should get what they asked for, not a burger with tomato and lettuce. So let's imagine that we have both of these orders and we get the toppings together for one and then the other. 
but they end up getting the same kind of burger. That wouldn't be right. So talk about unexpected. So how can this go wrong? We have a function that adds toppings to a burger and emits or sends it out. Notice we're using our mutable version of our burger and the function has side effects of changing the burger. Now we have a busy kitchen and we wanna take advantage of working on things concurrently so we can prep both burgers at once. We're gonna be using RxJava for this. If you're not familiar with RxJava, what we have here is that our function is adding the toppings to the burgers on their own schedulers. Think of this as two different cooks in the kitchen. In your programs, these might be on a worker scheduler or an IO scheduler. Then we're using merge to create a stream that emits the results of both of these at toppings um, observables. This merge can be thought of maybe one person delivering both of these burgers to the tables. We can't guarantee the order of the burgers, um, when they'll be ready, but whenever they are, they'll be delivered. <coughs> Excuse me. This will be done on another delivery scheduler, um, so likely your UI or main thread on Android. So I don't know if you spotted the issue, but both Kitchen cooks are modifying the same burger. So someone is gonna get the wrong order. There's gonna be a burger with all the same toppings on it. Let's see how this would be solved with immutability. Using our immutable burger, here's the modified add toppings method. Now in order to add the toppings, we need to create a new burger. With this change, there will be two different burgers delivered each with the correct toppings. By making our burger immutable and using a pure function, we were able to work concurrently without having that unexpected behavior. So next, higher order functions. Um, this is a huge thing that you hear when talking about functional programming. Um, with, funct uh, with higher order functions, functions are first class citizens. You can pass a function to another function and share logic in that way. Um, there's a number of places where this can be helpful. The classic example in Android is setting an on-click listener. It's also helpful when you have a situation where maybe the beginning and the end parts um, share the same logic but the middle bits change, such as maybe um, writing to a database or shared preferences. Um, we'll look at two examples, one of each of these cases. So starting when the beginning and the end are the same, but the middle parts are different. Um, so let's take a look at the events to cook and eat potatoes. We're always gonna wash and peel them, they're gonna be cooked in some way, but how they're cooked can vary. We'll have a function to make these potatoes that takes another function as a parameter for how to cook them. To declare that we wanna pass in a function as a parameter, we name the parameter, same as any others. Then we have the type we have for the input, in parentheses, an arrow, and then the return type. And then inside to call it, we call it like any other function. So here we have a make potatoes function that takes potatoes and a function in, preps the potatoes, cooks them according to the function passed in, and then we eat them because really, who doesn't want to eat potatoes? Then to call the function, um, we pass in the potatoes as normal. To pass in the function, we contain the logic or the lambda and curly braces. Um, we're going to name our input potatoes and then have an arrow. And then we're gonna fry them to say, make hash browns. Um, if you're familiar with Kotlin, you might notice that this is a bit verbose. Um, we can omit the naming of the variable potatoes and let it default to it. We can also uh, put the lambda outside of the parentheses um, because it's the last function or the last parameter of the function. And then there's also the option to use this function reference notation. So just like that, we have a function to make and eat any kind of potato without the repetition of including the prep work and eat work in every different way to cook it. 
So just look at the power that this gives us now. So here's an example from the Biscotti Library. Um, this function is for an espresso test um, that verifies that um, an activity was started, um, a specific activity. So it initializes the intents, performs what act action that should cause this activity to launch, um, that's passed in as a lambda, and then it verifies and releases. So time to look at another common case for using a higher order function, replacing that single function interface, often containing logic to respond to an event, such as the button click, or something being emitted in an Arc's Java stream. So here's our situation. We have a listener for when the customer is done eating, so we can clear the dishes and bring the tap check. We could pass in an object with a single function containing the logic for what to do when this happens, or we can take the much cleaner option and pass in a lambda, a pass in a function. Here, we're setting our unfinished eating listener um, so we can wait until the customer is done eating before performing these actions. So it would be weird before. And then a real life example. Um, this is setting a on refresh listener and then it's reloading conversations in there. So now that we know a bit about some of the functional language properties, um, here are some tools that can help you accomplish this. Um, one of the biggest ones that we've seen a lot of in this talk is the Kotlin programming language. Um, it has high, higher order functions and defaults towards immutability. <coughs> And it's a really great option if you're looking for using functional programming on Android. ArxJava, um, a library for working with streams of data, um, is, can also be really helpful. It has a declarative style, especially when working um, with collections and threads. Um, and it doesn't inherently cause any side effects. Arrow is also really great. It's a library for typed functional programming in Kotlin if you want to work in a more pure functional sense. Um, so if you're looking for monads and such, that will make you happy. Um, I haven't gotten a chance to work with it a ton, but it seems really awesome. Um, here are some resources. If you're interested, the slides are posted online. Um, if you found this talk interesting, I'm hoping you were able to go to these talks yesterday. If not, definitely look out for the videos. Um, Wynn talked a lot on a lot of great points on how the Kotlin standard library uses higher order functions to accomplish some awesome things for us. And then in Effective Kotlin, um, they gave us a great introduction to how you can use Kotlin for some of these properties that I talked about, as well as others. And then a quick note, um, I do have some books to give away from Ray Winderlich. If you tweet me um, your favorite part about Learning about Android or Kotlin, I'll enter you into a raffle to win. I'll pick someone at about, I'll pick two people, one for each book, at about four o'clock. If you don't do Twitter, come talk to me in person and I'll put your name down. Um, let me know what you like. Um, yeah, thank you so much for talking. The slides and resources are on my Twitter. Um, you can come find me after this talk if you have any questions at all about this talk, about working remotely, about Buffer, just want to come say hi, just want to come get stickers, they're right there. Um, or you can find me online. Um, yeah, thank you for coming.